Hey everyone, Happy New Year, and we want to say Happy New Year and welcome to the very first Radiotopia Presents of 2024. It's a series that we are truly excited about. It's called Shocking, Heartbreaking, Transformative. Now this is from documentarian Jess Shane, who put out an open call on Craigslist and then worked with four strangers to explore the standard rules that documentarians and journalists use to tell their subject stories. So the series gets into all sorts of questions about what happens when people's real lives are collected, edited, and consumed. The show pulls back the curtain on what goes on behind the scenes of your favorite nonfiction shows. And then it turns in on itself and some really interesting twists and turns along the way in the making of the show. I've gotten to know Jess a little bit over the making of this show. Every time I chat with her, there's a new wrinkle to this story. It is really incredible. So go check out the new Radiotopia Presents series, Shocking, Heartbreaking, Transformative. It is out now on your favorite podcast platform. Hello and welcome to this day in esoteric political history from Radiotopia. My name is Jody Avergan. This day, September 10th, 1833, President Andrew Jackson announces that the government will no longer use the Second Bank of the United States. The Second Bank was a private bank, but with federal duties. It handled all of the fiscal transactions for the United States government. It was accountable and created by Congress and the U.S. Treasury. So this was a big showdown and the latest major move in what were known as the Bank Wars. It is also part of a much bigger story about how Americans and American politicians have viewed the role of banks and financial institutions, the relationship between government and banks. So let's talk about it all. Let's go to the early 1830s to discuss. I'm joined, as always, by Nicole Hemmer of Columbia. Hello, Nikki. Hey, Jody. And our special guest for this episode is Jacob Goldstein, host of Planet Money and author of the new book, Money, the True Story of a Made-Up Thing. Jacob, thank you for doing this and congratulations on the book. Oh, thanks. Yeah. So fun to be here. I'm a fan of the show. Cool. You had me at esoteric. Yes. Really. <laughs> we, needed, we needed an adjective in there, and we spent a long time going back and forth on yeah, the adjective. Yeah, it's a good one. The, like the bank war is relatively esoteric. Yeah, no, this is perfect for us. Um, a, you know, small forgotten thing that, that, as I said, I think gets to some bigger stuff. Um, is bank war, is that selling it? Like, is it, you know, we put, we put that war sort of on a bunch of conflicts, but like, take us to the 1830s. I mean, is it genuinely a war? I, I mean, it's not a shooting war, well, yes, of but course. people have called it the bank war for more than 100 years. Um, so, so I'll just tell you a little bit of the story, yeah? Yeah. So, so, I mean, there's basically two antagonists, and they're like perfectly matched, perfectly opposed. There's uh, the president, Andrew Jackson, and there's the president of the Second Bank of the United States, Nicholas Biddle. And, you know, Jackson is this like tough guy. He was a general. You know, when he was 13 years old, he ran off to fight in the Revolutionary War. And then Biddle is this very highly educated, rich, elite guy who, when he was 13, he ran off to transfer from the University of Pennsylvania to Princeton, where he graduated <laughs> first in his class. So it's like perfect sort of types to be fighting this battle. So the second bank of the U.S. was this extraordinarily powerful institution. It was chartered by Congress. Congress gave it the ability to exist, but it was a private bank that made profits, paid out its profits to its shareholders, just like a regular private bank today. And so one reason the Second Bank of the U.S. was useful is it did provide in practical terms a national currency, right? It wasn't officially government-backed money the way it is today, but it was close to that. Uh, and so that was a convenience. You know, if you're traveling around the country or if you just want to move money around the country, it makes it much easier if you have a national bank. Yeah. And just to clarify, and then we will get to sort of why there was this showdown between the second bank and, and the president. But this is a bank that has branches. Um, it's, you know, it's much closer to what we think of as our sort of private bank at the moment. Was there any like, why did we have that as our national bank? Was there any controversy about sort of conceiving it in that way at that time? Yeah, I mean. The whole idea of whether or not to have a national bank was one of the main controversies in America for the first, you know, I would say uh, 40 years that the country existed. But in this moment, um, there is. And the Second Bank has a lot of official duties when it comes to taking care of the government's money. So, Nikki, as you best understand it, why does Jackson finally reach this breaking point and say, OK, 
you know, we're done here. We're breaking up. I, I think that there definitely are differences on monetary policy. Um, and Jacob's probably a better person to explain those. But I mean, it also fits in very clearly with Jackson's political stance, right? He sees himself as the defender of the little guy against the elites. Um, And that meant for him, so in particular, like opposing um, Northeastern elites, um, sometimes having some strong things to say about large slave holders and things like that. But it meant this kind of populism, right? Going up against Mm this sort of elite institution that during a previous panic had taken people's land when they fell into default, had taken people's homes when they fell into default. It was like the perfect thing for him to aim his arrows at when it came to his presidency. But this is the Bank of the United States, and I know it's a little murky, but it does have some official duties. So I'm just wondering, is there any element here of Jackson going up against something from his own government or at least the larger governmental ecosystem? You know, as as Jacob was saying, like it was still a pretty contentious idea, this Bank of America. And so, yes and, and no. I mean, it was a private entity. Yeah, um, I, I mean, that, I think that's an important point. Yeah. Like he wasn't like Congress had given it the right to exist, but it was a private company. It had private shareholders. It made profits. So it's it's not part of the government. The government has some authority over it, but quite limited. So he's going against a giant private bank, which if you're a populist is sure. like a great target, right? right? And that's where, I mean, I feel like this really ties into so much of what we see today. And I think there's sort of this through line of, you know, at some basic level, just distrust in banks. And Jacob, I wonder, as, you, as you've tried to sort of write your story of money, how much of a through line is that? Oh, it's all the way through line. I mean, uh, in America, especially, it's extraordinary. I mean, there's kind of two levels, right? One is just a wariness of banks, period. And actually, there's this moment when Andrew Jackson meets Nicholas Biddle, right? President of the United States meets President of the B- Bank of the United States. It's right after Jackson's uh, been elected president. It's in the White House. And Jackson says to Biddle, I do not dislike your bank any more than all banks, Right. Which is kind of awesome, like kind of a dick move, kind of awesome. And so, I mean, there's two levels. Right. I don't like any banks. Jackson had sort of lost a bunch of money in this finance thing. Lots of people don't like banks. I will say I think Jackson was probably lying here because the next level is like he really doesn't like the Bank of the United States. Right. And the big through line in American history, you see for most of American history from the time the country is founded all the way through into the early part of the 20th century is this big question of should we have a national bank? Should we have what today we would call a central bank? Yeah. And I mean, this is one of those fights. If you look at the rest of the 19th century, like you're constantly going through panics and crashes and all of these things where there isn't necessarily a strong stabilizing effect in the government. The fights in the late 19th century are more over like we can expand or contract the money supply by relying only on gold or relying on gold and silver. Like These are some pretty intense fights that people are having. It's in 1913 when you have this law that's passed that creates the Fed, and now you have this entity in the government that can stabilize the economy. And I mean, even as late as that, after decade after decade, when we had all these financial crises, in part because we didn't have a central bank, skepticism of central banking in America was so strong that the people who decided to plan the Fed, who were like a senator, uh, some bankers, a Harvard economist, they actually snuck off. They disguised themselves as duck hunters, met in secret at a private train car in Hoboken, and went off to this private resort to secretly plot the Fed because opposition to the notion of a central bank was so strong. It's also why, you know, today we have all these regional feds, right, which maybe you've heard of, maybe you haven't. But, you know, there's one in New York and there's one in St. Louis and there's one in San Francisco. There's like a dozen of them or so. A A part of the reason they did that was fear of centralized financial power was still so strong, right, that they thought, well, okay, what if we say it's not like one giant central bank, it's just a bunch of little friendly neighborhood central banks, maybe the people will buy that. And, I, you know, I want to get a little bit more at the at what is that fear? Is it just simply that 
it's consolidated wealth and control over wealth? Or is it also something at some level people are concerned when all of a sudden you have centralized wealth and centralized political power and the worry that those are connected in some formalized way? It can be that. I mean, it's complicated because for so long, central banks were private, right? Right. Like the second bank of the U.S. was private. And that was part of Jackson's uh, uh, beef with it, right? But you look at the language at the time and and, and people talked about the the, the second bank as kind of like in cahoots with political power as well. Absolutely. And, And at that time, I mean, you know, certainly to go back to Madison and Jackson agreed, or original Madison, anti-National Bank Madison, it was even should the federal government have this power at all, right? It was like a, a, a federalism question, right? What should be left to the states and what should be left to the federal government? And that question is a lot, as you say, about centralized power, period. So certainly at that time, it was a lot about that. And we should say that centralized economic power still happens, or I should say yeah. concentrated economic power, because by the end of the 19th century, but you have this moment where J.P. Morgan actually bails out the federal government because he's the person who has all the money, which is one of the reasons why you get the Fed in the first place, so that it's not financiers bailing people out. Right, right. The panic of 1907 is this moment when J.P. Morgan has to like basically lock all the bankers in New York in his like private library and say, like, solve this crisis. And after that, you would think that everybody would be like, OK, OK, we need a central bank. But no, the people have to go sneak off and pretend like they're not starting a central bank. So this bank war sort of idea and fight just persists for, you know, a century almost. So what is the fallout here? I mean, Jackson, you know, sort of threatens to disband this bank. Um, How does Biddle react? So there's a few steps. So the first big step comes uh, around 1832, I think, where so the way companies used to work, including the Bank of the U.S., is uh, Congress would give them or the state legislature would would give them a charter for a fixed amount of time, which is also interesting, right? Companies didn't used to be de facto immortal. The bank's charter was coming up for renewal in a few years, and Biddle was like, let's just push through a renewal now. Biddle was super powerful. Like, Jackson's skepticism was, you know, well-founded. He was was paying uh, uh, Daniel Webster, the famous senator. He was paying him money to support the bank while Webster was a senator. And Webster was supporting the bank. He was giving these amazing speeches in Congress about how important the bank was. And so Congress, with the help of Daniel Webster, who gives a great speech, passes a bill to uh, recharter the bank for another 20 years. And then Jackson vetoes it. And actually, Biddle, sort of weirdly in retrospect, after Jackson vetoes it, Biddle's like, ah, now I got him right where I want him. And Biddle like reprints Jackson's veto message because it's an election year. Mm-hmm. It's 1832. And Biddle thinks Jackson is going to lose over this, right? Because to be fair to Biddle, it seems ridiculous in retrospect because we know he lost. He had done a good job running this bank, right? Uh, The 1820s were an unusually stable period. Uh, He had used it to kind of manage the economy, which was like kind of a new idea, right? It's not obvious at all that you would use a bank to regulate other banks uh, to sort of manage the economy. But that is what was kind of evolving. People didn't use the term central bank yet. And of course, Biddle lived in this world of elites, all of whom liked the bank, not in sort of Jackson's world of, you know, frontier populists who hated the bank. Uh, Biddle was wrong. Jackson won re-election. Uh, but, you know, the bank still existed. It still had a few years to run. And it was the place where the federal government kept its money. So that is why, on this day in esoteric political history, uh, Jackson was like, OK, I don't want to wait till 1836 when the charter runs out. I want to kill this bank now. Let's take the federal government's money out of the bank. And in fact, this was a controversial decision, even within his own cabinet. His treasury secretary refused to do it uh, and wouldn't quit. Jackson had to fire him and appoint another uh, cabinet member to do it. Also, some echoes of today. Um, And and so the next cabinet secretary did it. They took the money out of uh, the Bank of the U.S. and redistributed it to state banks. And basically then the Bank of the U.S. withered away. You know, Biddle tried to fight, but he ultimately lost. One really interesting thing that happened, and I think it's important in like how we think about banks and centralized power, is this was not a blow against banking in general, right? Hmm. That's how Jackson played it. It's like, oh, the bankers are bad and the people are good. It was a blow against the bank of the U.S. and the rich people who own that stock. But it was great for the rich people who owned all the state banks, right? They got the government deposits. And now that the Second Bank of the U.S. wasn't there to sort of keep the state banks in check. They went wild lending and lending and lending. And there was first this boom and then this very terrible uh, bust, a, a crash in like 1836, 1837. That was to that point the worst financial crash 
uh, that the U.S. had seen. So Jackson won, but Biddle was sort of right. And Jackson didn't exactly win, right? I mean, doesn't the next year he gets censured by Congress for his abuse of presidential power by pulling this move, and then the Whig party emerges as a sort of in reaction to that? So it seems like this just created a big a big mess. Uh, yes, that's fair. And, and that, so then you have this amazing moment in, in kind of the history of money in America uh, after the Second Bank of the U.S. goes away, where states sort of push even further. They decide more or less anybody who wants to start a bank, who's willing to follow a few rules, can. And remember, this is a time when banks print their own money. So you get this incredible proliferation of all these different kinds of paper money, literally thousands of kinds of paper money uh, across the U.S. with every little, every little bank printing its own paper money, which is just so alien. And a useful reminder, you know, that like there are lots of ways to do money. The way we do money now is just one among infinite mm -hmm. options. Yeah, it's so weird to think about a time when a person could kind of scribble on a piece of paper and that was currency. Yes, yes. Yeah. There were actually these uh, periodicals that merchants would subscribe to called banknote reporters mm -hmm. that would like tell you. So if a customer walks in with some random piece of money from some bank you've never heard of, like, first of all, is it real? It would tell you what it looks like. And then second of all, you know, because the notes were only as good as the bank they were issued by, the banknote reporter would also tell you whether to discount the note, right? If, if it says a dollar, should you count it as a dollar or should you count it as 90 cents? And if the bank is far away or if it's about to go bust, you probably shouldn't count it as a full dollar. Well, this is, this is nice in that it, we've kind of reached the moment that I reach basically every time I'm reading about economics where I just somewhere in the back of my head a question pops up. It's just like, wait a minute. Hold up. What is money? Like, no matter how <laughs> specific the story I'm oh, reading, yeah. or like any piece of news, I just always hit that moment. I'm sure, Jacob, you hit that all the time. I'm sure that's why you wrote this book. Uh, but it is like, it's just the persistent question for me. Um, but I am fascinated, Nikki, by, you know, something you, you hinted at, but like how much financial policy um, was not a conversation just among politicians, but it just seemed to be an obsession with the country in general. Yeah, this was a backbone of American politics and to a certain extent of American political culture throughout the 19th century in a way that I think it's kind of hard to wrap our minds around now that like in the late 19th century, you would have farmers debating about whether U.S. money should be backed by gold or by gold and silver and that these would be not just like really intense economic arguments, but the kind of thing that got people's passion so high that they would come to blows over it. Or, you know, when Nicholas Biddle makes some decisions, the mob comes for him because people are so upset about the economic policies that he's setting. That um, does actually happen, right? In 1834, yeah. a mob shows up at his house yeah. uh, in Philadelphia. Yeah. Over like inflationary <laughs> policy or what have you. And that kind of... Uh, debate, which does seem extremely esoteric in today's politics, um, was central in, you know, the first half of American history. I mean, in a sense, just to pull together the two things you guys just said, like that hundred plus year argument was really an argument over what is money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I, I will say maybe we're not having those debates in a, such a fine grain uh, way right now. But I mean, we are still obsessed with these baseline questions. Um, and it seems to be maybe the, the thing that we are most consistently obsessed with are questions of wealth and, and money and consolidation and, and so forth. Yeah, we just use a different language about it today. I yeah. Think. Yeah. And I mean, in a smaller way, it's not as dramatic as the 19th century stuff we're talking about. But what the Federal Reserve has been doing just over the last few months uh, since the yeah, crisis right. hit is is dramatic, I mean, and, and unprecedented, and is a, a subtler kind of shift, right? I mean, the Fed is, is pushing into parts of the economy that it has not been in before. It's, you know, it's lending not just to the financial system as it traditionally has, but to normal businesses. It's creating trillions of dollars out of thin air. And there are so many other things going on that that has not been sort of central to the national conversation. But it is profound and it is changing. And the way the Fed itself thinks about money and inflation and its job is continuing to, to evolve and to change. 
All right, well, that seems like a good place to leave it. So um, Jacob Goldstein, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, the new book is Money, the True Story of a Made-Up Thing. Go get the book. It is out now. Money, the True Story of a Made-Up Thing. Thanks again for doing this. Oh, it's really fun. And thanks to you, Nicole Hemmer. Thanks, Jody. This Day in Esoteric Political History is a proud member of Radiotopia from PRX. Our researcher and producer is Jacob Feldman. Our producer is Brittany Brown. Follow us on social media. We are posting on Twitter and Instagram every day. Some moments that we don't get to on the show. You can find those at This Day Pod on Twitter and Instagram. My name is Jody Avergan. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you soon. Radiotopia.